We must not stop now. We have come too far to turn back. A nation that has progressed because of the sweat and blood of thousands of blacks, a nation that first tolerated slavery, then outlawed it, that accepted separate but equal as a valid constitutional concept, then rejected it, a nation that has slowly, painfully, tragically evolved to the point where a black can run for the presidency, a nation that has come so far must not now give up the struggle to rid itself of racism. In 1949, Thurgood Marshall turned to his 31-year-old special counsel, an obscure New York lawyer named Franklin Williams. When the NAACP Legal Defense Fund was asked to help four young black men who were accused of raping a white woman in Groveland, Florida. One of the suspects was killed by a posse before being arrested. Two were taken out on a desolate road by the sheriff and shot. The three who survived for trial were convicted by an all-white jury on the strength of false confessions that resulted from torture. Two were sentenced to die in the electric chair. One, who was 16, was sentenced to life in prison. All were innocent. But their innocence was of no consequence in 1949 in the Deep South. A white jury could simply never credit the word of a black man over that of a white girl. It was socially and politically unthinkable. Franklin Williams was thrown into the middle of this cultural and legal minefield. I saw what one man with a law degree can do. And that was, for me, the most important thing that has impacted my life. There were riots. They bombed uh, a civil rights activist's home. Uh, and he saw this. He was part of this. He was brave enough to defend these young men and, and did this throughout the South, by the way. So this was not just someone who spoke civil rights. This is someone who put his life on the line for civil rights. Franklin Hall Williams was a visionary and trailblazer who devoted his life to fostering better relations between all communities, not through acrimony and violence, but through reason and example. Throughout his lifetime, he would play many roles, attorney, civil rights leader, diplomat, organizer of the Peace Corps, United Nations representative, foundation president. In the late 1980s, the New York State Judicial Commission on Minorities was formed to promote racial and ethnic fairness in the courts. The first such court-based commission ever established in the United States. The commission was first formed at the suggestion of the Coalition of Blacks in Court, the members of which represent various judicial and non-judicial organizations. It would end up being Williams' last major professional achievement, and the commission, since renamed the Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission, is his lasting legacy. But with all those accomplishments, Franklin Williams and his role in the civil rights movement still remains unknown to many, a footnote to history. The irony is, at least to me, um, how very few people knew about Franklin Williams. I mean, across the board, he was not a uh, quote unquote famous person. You know, he was not in, in, in the, while he was in the footsteps, he, he did not achieve the kind of notoriety that Thurgood did. Um, uh, but if, when you look at his life, you realize how much uh, of an impact this man had. It's important to understand that the civil rights movement was moved, took place by others than Martin Luther King. I think people played different roles and different parts in that struggle and that it wasn't all marches and it wasn't all uh, 
uh, speeches by eloquent people and it wasn't all mass movements that all along the road from the first slave that ever ran away to people who were bridge figures like Franklin who could easily move in white society. Franklin Hall Williams was born October 22, 1917 in Flushing, Queens. His ancestors included Native Americans, black freedmen, runaway slaves, Dutch and English immigrants, and even black slave owners. Franklin lived in a house with 18 people who represented every shade imaginable, from a grandmother with white skin, red hair, freckles, and blue eyes, to a dark-skinned cousin. His mother, Alinda Lowry Williams, would die before Franklin celebrated his second birthday. His father, an itinerant musician named Arthur Williams, had been banished from the household by Alinda's father, Thaddeus Lowry. Franklin and his two older brothers were raised by their grandfather in those early years. His grandfather was, came from a family of slave-owning blacks in Virginia. And Thad Lowry was a very arrogant man who adored his grandchildren and his children. And so there was a community of black kids who lived not far from Franklin, and he wasn't allowed to play with them. So it wasn't a matter of color. It was a matter of his grandfather saying, you, you have enough, you can play with your cousins. You don't have to go play with those kids. Those kids are not good enough for you. The color didn't come until he was an adolescent, and then it hit hard. When he was in the Boy Scouts, he was in an integrated Boy Scout troop. And one day they were all going to go to the um, public pool together. And when he got there, he was the only African-American in the group, and they wouldn't let him in. And they told him why. And of course, he went home and cried. And I think that was the beginning of his desire to um, uh, do something about it. And that was the seed that was planted in, in his head. Because up till then, I think, you know, it was just kid stuff. And then that made it made discrimination real, real to him. Carolyn Robertson was his very good friend. And he used to go ice skating with Carolyn Robertson and other kids in the park uh, in the winter time. And somebody got the idea one evening that they should go to the movies. And it was wonderful and they had a good time. And when they walked out of the movie, Mr. and Mr. Robis Robertson was there, were there waiting. And they took Franklin and threw him up against the wall. And they said, you stick to your own kind. And if I ever call, see you with my daughter again, I will call the police. Now that came as a tremendous shock to him because he had grown up with this kid. They had not minded him playing with her when he was 10 and 11. But the minute he turned 13 or 14, that became what it became. And he was devastated by, by that. Franklin had, you know, been sort of mistreated as a, as a kid by the establishment. And uh, I think that one had a sense that he wanted to right the wrongs that it, he had felt. And I think that drove him with respect to his desire for justice. By the time Thaddeus Lowry had passed away, the Queen's home Franklin grew up in was a distant memory. And Franklin's uncle, Dr. Edward Lowry, became his surrogate father during the early years of the Depression. Franklin made the best of it and worked a number of odd jobs to make ends meet. It was during this time that he also discovered that dressing with style and purpose was important, something that would stay with him the rest of his life. He had a thing about shopping you know today we talk about uh, shopping while black some talk about that and he he would talk about how he would go into stores and feel the eyes upon him while shopping and in order to make a statement he would go into let's say Bergdorf's or a store of that nature and that um, in those styles and 
He would buy, he'd, he'd try on a pair of shoes, he liked the shoes, and just to show people he'd buy another pair of the same shoes. Because there was something about him that was still carrying around the sense of inequality that he grew with, um, that he crusaded against. After graduating high school, Franklin found himself spending more and more time in Harlem, working during the day and staying out late at night but he never lost sight of his goal to attend college. In 1937, Franklin enrolled in Lincoln University. He had scraped together some savings for tuition and was aided by Dr. May Edward Chin, a neighbor and the first African-American woman to graduate from Bellevue Hospital Medical School. The daughter of an escaped slave, Dr. Chin was Franklin's godmother. Franklin worked to pay for his tuition, and Dr. Chin made up the difference. She was dad's godmother, and she was my godmother. She was a very, very close friend of the family, and just the sweetest woman you could ever, you could ever think of. Four years later, in 1941, he received a degree in philosophy with minors in French and sociology, graduating cum laude, and he was class salutatorian. He was very, very committed to his alma mater, Lincoln University. And um, as you may or may not know, Lincoln University was the first historically black college to be a degree-granting institution. He often spoke to me about how, uh, how he loved in Lincoln University. So I think there was something that happened during those four years he was where he was a student um, scholar that informed his thinking, perhaps enhanced his thinking for a passion for justice um, and an understanding of leadership. Lincoln accepted him in ways that left indelible marks on his life. And he felt that he learned about equality. He learned about accepting people for who they were and not for where they came. Uh, from whence they came, and I think that, that shaped him in terms of justice. After graduation, Franklin began his studies at Fordham University. That is until World War II beckoned. I was drafted with white friends, but I and other colored men were segregated from the moment we entered the Fort Dix Reception Center. From that point on, although previously these white friends had never felt any superiority, I began to recognize in them an almost unconscious acceptance of the principle that we couldn't live or fight together, and I rebelled against it. First of all, he hated the Army, and the Army hated him. First, he was sent to Fort Dix in New Jersey with all the people who drafted white, black, and everyone. And then they all lined up, and the whites and blacks were separated. And then they defined black as the skin color was dependent on the person in front of you or in back of you. So it was very arbitrary deciding of who was black and who was white. Then they marched, Franklin said that it was at, it was at night and it was raining and the first group of soldiers that they marched away were white soldiers and they marched them to these white barracks and uh, pretty soon the lights were on and they, he heard music coming from the barracks and it seemed all very decent except that he was standing in the mud waiting to be called. When the black soldiers were called they were marched miles away and they were put into tents with no floors, no electricity, I mean, the difference couldn't have been more stark at that point. The army, I think, was the beginning of his real racial consciousness raising. It is no secret that the Negro today is deeply resentful at much of the treatment at the hands of the army and navy. We gain little if the military protects us from Hitler's brand of racism yet impresses upon the minds of our young men a domestic brand of racism at variance with democratic ideals. Franklin spent much of his service time hospitalized 
with a variety of ailments and was honorably discharged in 1943. Soon after his discharge, Franklin married the former Shirley Broyard, a native of New Orleans. Shirley would become his rock, his conscience, his intellectual equal, and then some. Franklin passed the New York State Bar Exam in 1945 and quickly found himself working at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York City as assistant counsel to Thurgood Marshall. Marshall, who would become the first black justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, had established the Legal Defense Fund in 1940 and served as director counsel until 1961. Williams was the first deputy that Marshall allowed to argue before the Supreme Court. And when he did, he made quite an impression. During arguments, the legendary Justice Felix Frankfurter sent a note to his clerk, William T. Coleman, Jr., who was the first African-American clerk to serve on the Supreme Court. Justice Frankfurter urged him to come into the courtroom and observe this, quote, excellent, close quote, young attorney. One of Wilms's first NAACP matters involved a decorated and uniformed African-American World War II veteran named Isaac Woodard Jr., who had the temerity to talk back to a white Greyhound bus driver in 1946 while heading home to reunite with his wife. Woodard had just been honorably discharged from the Army. Sergeant Woodard's sin cost him his eyesight when a police officer in Batesburg, South Carolina, punished him with a blackjack. The blinding of Isaac Woodard seemed to open Americans' eyes to racial injustice. Isaac and Franklin went on a nationwide speaking tour, raising money and awareness. They appeared with heavyweight fighter Joe Lewis at Harlem's Lewis Own Stadium, drawing 20,000 people and raising $22,000. In later years, Williams would do other fundraising tours for the Legal Defense Fund with such luminaries as Jackie Robinson. Jackie and then his widow, Rachel, became lifelong friends of the Williams family. In the Groveland case, Franklin became the first black lawyer ever to sit on a legal team in any Lake County courtroom. And in that case, was exposed to coerced confessions, lynching attempts, and mob violence, complicit with local law enforcement. We discussed about, you know, how his own life was, you know, was at risk and how he had to do the traveling uh, from, from Orlando to, to Groveland uh, to, to, you know, be able to uh, undertake the responsibility of it. And the, my recollection, my recollection of, uh, of it, uh, what has stayed with me is the fear. How much fear must have he been living with every day taking on that kind of a case? Uh, that, that's not something that, that most lawyers even experience, you know, to have to literally fear for your life um, as, as you take on a case. That, that's impressive. One of the lawyers on the case was a young, idealistic, inexperienced, recent law school graduate named Jack Greenberg, who went on to an illustrious career as a civil rights attorney and scholar. Greenberg succeeded Thurgood Marshall as director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. The immediate issues facing us was the confessions that the defendants were supposed to have made and they claim well, he, he shown them easily having beaten and tortured to make these confessions. And so we had to somehow invalidate them so that they were not to be believed. They could not be admitted in the evidence. Williams had no hope of an acquittal. The trial was a travesty and he aimed mainly to save the boys' lives and establish a record for appeal. But he steadfastly refused to even consider a plea deal 
where the boys would confess to a crime they had not committed. I never believed that we would have anything but a verdict of guilty. It never entered my mind. I hoped that we might get life rather than death, but I never believed that these boys would be found innocent. So we wanted to get an acquittal for dismissal of the charges. Uh, and, uh, he was not going to agree anything, anything other than that. There was one point in the case, I think, in which the prosecutor said, if you confess that you committed the crime, then we won't uh, we ask for the death penalty. Nobody agreed to that. The jury would find all the defendants guilty. However, Williams convinced the Supreme Court to hear the case. Williams wanted to argue the case. Marshall subsequently transferred Williams to California. Well, they really, uh, uh, to all our appearances, they got along very badly. Uh, he, I think he was, so he was overly cautious, uh, did things too slowly, they wouldn't take any chances. Thurgood came from the South, and he had a ribald sense of humor, and he had a folksy style, and Franklin thought that was tacky and in poor taste. And Franklin wore three-piece suits that were tailored. Franklin would not be the one to sit down with a bunch of farmers and shoot the breeze. But on the other hand, they were both powerful intellects. They were both fast on their feet with the use of language. They both were analytical and smart. They were both um, cared deeply about, about injustice. Um, and I think that um, Thurgood found Franklin threatening because he saw himself in Franklin. Well, I think they were both, they both had very large egos, um, from what I understand. He didn't make a big deal out of it because he did admire Thurgood Marshall, you know, as, as he should. Um, and I think, in his own way, Thurgood Marshall admired him as a young, up-and-coming guy, but they just had too many ideas about who should do what and they both had huge egos and they really shouldn't be in the same place at the same time when they were working because it was just going to end up being a yelling screaming match. In California, Williams won the first school desegregation case and later, as an assistant attorney general, created the first constitutional rights section within the Department of Justice. His growing prominence and reason approach brought him to the attention of the Kennedy administration. And in 1961, Sergeant Shriver invited Williams to join the administration at the newly established Peace Corps. He had been uh, rewarded with the Peace Corps assignment because when he was in California, he was selected or volunteered to raise, I don't know, a million black voters for, for Kennedy. And he came to the notice of Sergeant Shriver and he became very friendly with Sergeant Shriver. In 1965, President Johnson asked his newly appointed Solicitor General, Thurgood Marshall, for the names of black leaders suitable for top government positions. Ultimately, he appointed Williams ambassador to Ghana, where his Lincoln University classmate, Kwame Nkrumah, was president and prime minister. Well, now, can I tell you something without your discussion with a human? Why, certainly. What would you think about his taking Shriver's place at the Peace Corps? Terrific. I would put Frank there without any hesitation because he can come up with more ideas in a minute than, than most people I know of, and they're darn good ones. I think from there he'll drive like mad, and he'll drive everybody under him, too, because he puts in a real day's work. He's terrific. I think he'd be good. Yes, sir. He was on a plane, and 
he was, I think he was sitting in first class and he was one of the few, if not the only one in first class and the uh, flight attendant started talking to him and asked, what do you do? And um, he said, I'm a, a U.S. ambassador. And she looked at him askance and went back to the galley and he overheard her say, that man, that black man in first class is crazy. He thinks he's Adlai Stevenson. Upon his return from Ghana in 1968, Williams was selected to head a new urban center at Columbia University, which resulted in major curriculum changes. But he grew increasingly discouraged over the slow pace of civil rights and concerned with the violent approach of the black power movement. He fully appreciated the frustration of African Americans and firmly believed they had a right to demand equality and full participation in the richness of American culture. Yet, he was also adamant that the violent response of some black organizations was morally wrong and politically disastrous. Franklin had a lot of trouble with militant blacks. Um, Franklin was not militant. Franklin felt that uh, he was proud to be an American. Franklin felt that uh, the system, that evils that had happened in the past were slowly working, some, working themselves out. Franklin felt that education and Western civilization and knowledge and learning uh, were important. He also was big on form. He didn't like people shouting and clenching fists. In 1970, Ambassador Williams became president of the Phelps Stokes Fund, which had been established in 1911 to improve the education of American Blacks, American Indians, and Africans. While Ambassador Williams was at Phelps Stokes, Chief Judge Saul Wachler was increasingly embarrassed and troubled by the lack of diversity in the judicial system. A coalition of Black judges had come to the Chief Judge, voicing their concerns as well. Wachler established a commission and appointed Williams as chair. I, I don't think that uh, there are many people in the history of the civil rights movement who could match his credentials, qualifications, and abilities. So I called him up. Uh, I remember calling him from my house in Albany, and uh, a cold call. And I introduced myself, and I told him at length what I um, was thinking about and uh, concerned with and asked whether he would undertake the chairmanship of it. And his first answer, and I noticed that this is quoted in the um, commission, ultimate commission report, is his answer was, you know, uh, when you start digging into this problem, you're gonna create wounds, and wounds that can't be covered over or cured with a Band-Aid. I said, I understand that. I said, that's why I want you to do it that I want someone who is not going to uh, be a, a company man. Franklin Williams was the obvious choice because he had the, again, the credibility, the strength to do it, and yet he was not a rock thrower. That was not Franklin Williams. He was not someone who was yelling and screaming. That was not him in the slightest. To being a distinguished demeanor, called it the way he saw it, um, but not, you know, what you might call, you know, uh, 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 a rabble rouser. That, that just wasn't his nature. You know? The chief judge and ambassador hit it off immediately because they both understood that the commission had to be independent that if it was viewed as simply being a handmaiden of the court administration or the chief judge, it would have no credibility. For that reason, Williams refused to take so much as a penny from the court system. He was insistent that no one in the court system, not even the chief judge, could in any way influence what the commission was doing. Wachler agreed to all of his demands. I can remember uh, Judge Walker when he first spoke to us as, at our first meeting saying, 
uh, to someone, uh, you know, can you imagine walking into a courtroom and there's no one else in that courtroom that looks like you and you're being charged with a crime? How do you feel? What type of justice do you think that you're going to get? I give Judge Wattler a lot of credit for what he did. He, he had the, you know, he, he was dedicated and he backed us up 100%. The new commission was not provided with the access to information that Chief Judge Wattler had promised. <clears throat> That's when Jonathan Lippman came in. Then Jonathan was the fourth important person here because he uh, saw what was going on and some of us were threatening to quit this commission because of the stonewalling OCA was doing. And uh, Jonathan stepped in and says, I can, I'll get that for you, I'll get the information. He's a very straight-laced DA type and he was, he couldn't contain himself how angry he was. And yet, Wackler basically told him, you fix it. When Wackler and Lipman intervened and the commission got the cooperation and data it needed, it began conducting hearings around the state to gather more information and then engaged in rigorous and vigorous debate. With his personality and experience, Franklin Williams was a persuasive leader, as well as a calming influence on the commission. He was a charming, elegant man. And you know, the kind of person that gets you to say yes after a few minutes, even though you started off saying, absolutely not. What is this insanity? He was fearless. I think um, that he would take, uh, take on anybody. He just did what he felt was right and what was the right thing to do, and he went out and did it. He was uh, just a, f a phenomenon. He found it shocking that the courts, which were used primarily by poor and black and brown and minority uh, litigants, were in disastrous shape, whereas the court for the more wealthy, um, the commercial divisions, uh, and that like were more um, elegant, more comfortable, more appropriate for the treatment of people in general where you're in a building of justice. On Williams's insistence, the commission held hearings across the state. It was also important to see the problem from multiple perspectives, not just from the perspectives of those who were within the system and understood that something was wrong but also from the perspective of people who were experiencing the prejudice um, and seeing it more clearly than anyone on the other side. With the facts in hand, the commission's task was to produce a no holds barred report. Its report, highly critical of the way the New York State court system treated minorities, shocked the judiciary to the very top. I think Judge Wachler uh, opened more of a Pandora's box than he uh, thought originally. Because, um, fra and I don't mean this in, a, in a, uh, um, an inflammatory way, uh, uh, Frank Williams could not be uh, uh, bought, micromanaged, uh, uh, he was going to call it exactly the way he saw it. And I think to some degree we all believe that you sort of asked to do someone to do a report or an inquiry or whatever you want to call it, investigation, um, there's going to be a level of cooperation, and there was. But I think that it went beyond that. And I think as, 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 as I said, I believe that, that maybe there was more there than Saul or Matt or anyone really thought. And I think uh, um, uh, Ambassador Williams, being the kind of uh, character that he was, uh, looked for it, found it, um, and we're all the better for it. 
The legacy of independence created by Franklin Williams has continued over the decades. The legacy is that we have a commission that now is really proactive in terms of trying to promote minorities, trying to recruit minorities, and certainly keep them within the system. And thanks to the chief judges, the ones that I worked under, Judge Kay and Judge Lippman, they were very, very, very supportive. And I think, you know, it starts at the top. The leadership has to set the tone in terms of getting people to kind of try to do the right thing. Every person who comes through the courthouse doors, whether as a litigant, visitor, or employee, is entitled to equal treatment and respect. That is the legacy of Franklin Williams, and I am absolutely committed to the goals and the mission of the Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission, and I'm proud to carry the baton that has been handed down from Chief Judge Wachler to Chief Judge Kay to Chief Judge Lippman, and now to me. If Franklin Williams came back, I think that he would be impressed by the fact that there is a permanent commission in continuous dialogue with the chief administrative judge and the chief administrator. And he would be impressed by the increase in the number of minorities in the court, working in the court system. He would be impressed by the number of uh, minority judges. And uh, I think that he would um, feel that his work uh, had been successful in that almost all of the things that he recommended have been adopted by the system in general. When you think back of all the lawyers who practiced in those years at the NAACP and the Legal Defense Fund, um, all the people who were running major civil rights organizations, uh, there was um, both a wonderful commitment and a wonderful sense of accomplishment and capability, patience, <laughs> tolerance, ability to deal with some very difficult situations with a great deal of grace. I think he'd want to be remembered as a guy who did his damnedest to get done the things that needed to get done, especially in terms of civil rights and, and charitable organizations in general. And that he hopes he set a, set a good enough example that the people that follow him will keep up the good work. And if, and, and if they can, then that's all he needs. He knew, I, I'm sure he was going to convinced that he would never get everything done. It just wouldn't happen. Uh, you know, you hope for it, you aim for the stars, and you get to the moon. Well, that's, that's great. So he aimed for the stars and got to the moon, and he hopes people remember it for someone that aimed for the stars. And did what he could and advanced the cause as far as he could in his own personal way and helped convince other people to, try, to do their best to advance the cause.